Hello, advanced English learners. Welcome back to another conversation. I have Greg here joining me for a very special conversation. We decided that we would talk about the question, what do Americans eat? Mm. All right, let's get to it. All right, I'm excited. Yeah, this is a great one because I feel like, in my personal experience, when I've lived abroad, studied abroad, worked abroad, I've had so many people ask me somewhere along the lines of, what do Americans eat? What is typical American food? Is it hamburgers, hot dogs, and pizza? And basically, what is the traditional American food? So what is your experience with that? Yeah, I, you're right that uh, most people will jump to something like pizza, burgers, uh, and they wouldn't be wrong, to be honest, because I happen to love pizza and burgers, and I'm American, and most Americans I know do love that type of food. But when you dig a little deeper, uh, there's actually a lot more going on with American cuisine, uh, also known as food, right. cuisine and food. Um, then, then meets the eye, right? Mm -hmm. Because America is such a diverse blend of cultures. Right. So, you know, uh, if you look at all the popular foods, they actually have origins in other countries. So, a burger is more German. Uh, pizzas, you know, I, are, people often think of Italian. Right. Right. Um, and then you have Mexican food, right? Um, very true. There's a very large Spanish-speaking population in the U.S. Um, and a lot of that comes from South America yep. um, uh, and Mexico. And so you have uh, all of that influence on, on the cuisine as well. So America ends up being this incredible blend 100%. of different types of food. Yeah, and you can basically find any type of food from any country, region, even within the U.S., different varieties um, of cuisine anywhere, basically. I mean, I don't think, unless you're in a very, very small town, you might have some difficulty finding, you know, specific uh, cuisines. But I feel like for the most part, you can generally access a pretty wide range, which is awesome. Yeah, there, there definitely is, particularly when you get to the bigger cities. Yeah. Um, you get anything, yeah, anything you want. The other fun thing is because of this hybrid, you yeah. have funny names for foods too. So we were talking about Mexican food. Yeah. Um, what you also have is Americanized Mexican food. That's right. Which they call Tex-Mex, right? Yeah, that's Tex right. for Texas yeah. and Mex for Mexican. So obviously uh, there's a lot, of, Texas has a lot of Mexican influence, um, including the food. And so, right. yeah, you can get Tex-Mex food, which is, I love, it's delicious. It's fairly Americanized Mexican food. So let's talk about that for a second. What does it mean for the food to be Americanized? Because we talk about um, like Chinese food in the U.S. can be Americanized. Mexican food might be Americanized. Uh, Turkish food might be Americanized to a certain extent. What does that mean for some type of cuisine to be Americanized? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, and Americanized is almost not a real word. Yeah. Um, but to be eyesed is like to transform, to turn into something, right. right? So we're saying it's Americanized, it's being transformed into American. Um, and this just happens a lot in America. There's a lot of cultural assimilation. Yeah. And so that happens certainly with food, right? So when a uh, immigrant uh, moves to the US and particularly uh, forms a community there of yeah. immigrants from the same country, they start to blend with the American elements, right? So their their uh, original cultural heritage starts to blend with the American That's right. heritage, um, and you get this cool fusion of of flavors and spices in the food. Right. And so when food becomes Americanized, um, it typically starts to incorporate some of the aspects that Americans like to have. Um, often things get more fried. Right. Americans like things fried. For sure. Things tend to get sweeter. Sweeter. Americans like sweet food. Yeah. And then they also tend to get bigger. Yes. Double the portion. Yes. I remember when I was in France, and this is not uh, 
uncommon for people to sort of notice in France, if, especially if they have gone to the U.S. or visited the U.S. and they come back to France, they notice the portions are doubled in the U.S., sometimes tripled. And what we have sometimes, too, is family size. So if you go out to eat, there might be on the menu family size. And so what that means is, you know, you could have two or three people share it. The idea is to order maybe fewer dishes, but they're really big and you can share them. I always love family size because it's very inclusive. It's very fun. And obviously, you're not going to sit down and eat that by yourself because it's not meant to be a portion for one person. But it is very fun to, you know, order a couple of dishes and then try them out with each other because that is a nice way of sampling different dishes at that restaurant. Yeah, and I always remember when I'm traveling abroad, particularly in Asia where portion sizes I find are a little smaller, Yeah, I always remind myself, okay, this is not going to be an American portion. Right. Uh, so I have to remember that maybe I'll get two of these. Maybe uh, three. Maybe three. <laughs> um, or maybe we'll get something else to share. Exactly. Because we're used to eating more. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's not necessarily a good thing, but it, it is a fact. <laughs> it is what it is, yeah. And um, the other thing, though, you know, a lot of people, when they go out to restaurants, they'll ask for a doggy bag, and that way you can take away maybe half of what you didn't get to finish. And you're, since you're paying for the entire meal, you might as well take what you hadn't finished and you have it the next day for lunch, let's say. Yeah, for takeout. For exactly. takeout, yeah. Uh, or take home, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, takeout would really be if you're ordering it from home. Right. Or you're going to pick it up. Right. Um, take and, home would yeah. be if you're in the restaurant, you have some extra food left over, and you say, I'll, I'll box this, I'll take it home. Yeah, you could say, I'll box it up and take it home, or I'll take a doggy bag. And um, yeah. that comes from sort of the tradition of saying that you're not going to eat this the next day, but your dog will have it. Which, of course... That's what you... Uh, see, I have a different interpretation of doggy bag. Really? Which is when you go and take a dog for a walk, uh -huh. you have to bring a little bag with you. Oh, really? That's interesting. Right? Because you have to clean up anything they leave. You don't want to leave a trace with your dog. So huh. anything they leave on the ground, you got to put in that little bag. I think so you I put in a little bag. Yeah. It's your doggy bag. That is interesting. I think I remember reading in French class eons ago that somewhere uh, in France, this uh, in the 19th century, this sort of... Uh, came into fashion, having a mm. doggy bag, so you wouldn't finish everything because you didn't want to look like a, you know, <laughs> a someone, glutton. A glutton, <laughs> just like shoveling an in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you want to look like an American. <laughs> an American on Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah, or at yeah. a barbecue. We do love our barbecues and Thanksgiving, that's I like sure. your interpretation better. I think that's a much classier interpretation. I think that's what I remember reading. I don't we'll think go with that yours. I'm making this up, but <laughs> I would love for someone to Yeah, fact if anyone check. can figure out the etymology of doggy bag, that would yeah. be great. It'd be awesome. Speaking of Thanksgiving, so the other question I sort of get when I'm abroad, and I don't know about you, Greg, but people ask, what's the traditional American food? Or oftentimes mm. people say, you don't have traditional American food. And I'll stop and think for a minute, and then I'll definitely, something will come to mind. And I'm wondering if you agree with me on this. That America doesn't have a traditional food? That we do. Well, that we I, 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 see, that's a little bit, Confusing. Mm. I don't know that it would be a traditional food per se, but we have traditions around food. Absolutely, yeah. I would say we have holiday specific foods. Exactly. Right? That's what I was thinking um, of. The uh, the most obvious being Thanksgiving. A hundred percent. Right. At Thanksgiving, if you ask any American what's the first thing that comes to mind on Thanksgiving, guaranteed they'll say Turkey. Turkey. Yeah. Of course. And then we'll have specific pies like pumpkin pie, apple pie. Generally, that pecan maybe some people yeah, tend to have. Exactly. But we have tradition. We have foods that we definitely eat on that day, or at least, technically speaking, a lot of people do. <laughs> there are some years where people might just opt for a chicken as opposed to a turkey. Yeah, but yeah. For the most part. But it still is a good question. You know, if if you are, let's say, you start a restaurant in Germany. Yeah. Because I brought it up earlier. And you're going to start an American restaurant there. Yeah. What dishes do you serve, right? What's right. traditional American food? Right, exactly. It's, I mean, it's honestly, tough to put your finger on. what comes to mind, and this will kind of perpetuate the stereotype of Americans eating burgers and pizza and hot dogs. I mean, it, the reality is, is that a lot of people, myself included, like I'll definitely enjoy a burger if we go out and like they'll have a nice, you know, brioche bun and a 
you know, caramelized onions. Like there's a thing in the U.S. called a gourmet burger. Yeah. I think those are great. Um, or, you know, like a barbecue also comes to mind. Barbecue is a good one. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Particularly um, in Texas. Texas is yeah. most famous for it. Um, but exactly. throughout the South, uh, you have a barbecue as a centerpiece of anyone's house, right? Right. Um, and, and, and their regular diet. Uh, and barbecue is just basically you get a grill uh, or a smoker um, and a bunch of meat and veggies, and you throw it all on the grill. Yeah. Um, you get all taste. And they have barbecue everywhere in the world For these sure. days. Yeah. Um, but I do think of barbecue, American Texas style barbecue. As something that's uniquely American. Yeah, and the, the sauce is also so good. I particularly really like it. And if you go into it very much so, you'll notice, like if you start digging deep, you'll see that there are different varieties of barbecue sauce. There's not just one barbecue sauce. There's so many different uh, types of yeah. barbecue sauce. Yeah. And so I think if going back to that restaurant example, if what you were going to do, you would have to sort of, um, designate what type of American food. So yeah. if it's traditional American comfort food, then you're going to see burgers on there. You're, fried chicken. You're going to see fried one. chicken, yeah. uh, some of these staples, um, probably mac and cheese, yeah. right? Mac That's and an, cheese. Which is macaroni, pasta with, with cheese, um, creamy and delicious. Yeah. You're going to see those mashed comfort. Potatoes. Mashed potatoes. cornbread, right? These are all sort yeah. of American staples. Um and then you could also do something more like, uh, you could say, upscale modern American cuisine. Yeah. Right? And that would be more refined, um, more delicate flavors, probably a lot of farm fresh, um, you know, ingredients. Yeah. Uh, borrowing probably from other cultures that have sort of made their way into the U.S. Um, yes. st stuff that you might not expect um, to be on a, an American menu. That's right. And there's also the fusion element, which yes. is what you were alluding to earlier with different influences from different places. And that's different from something being Americanized. For example, if Thai food is Americanized, I just remember being in Thailand and it was not, it was so delicious, but it wasn't as sweet, which I actually preferred. I didn't want it to be sweet. Uh, just like the Pad Thai, for example, that I had ordered or that coconut soup that I love. I forget the name, but yeah, I had the same experience with Chinese yeah. food, right? So I lived in China for, for several years. Right. And uh, the Chinese food there, I mean, first of all, China's a huge country. Yeah. So different parts of China, you get very different types of food. In the U.S., if you go to a Chinese food restaurant anywhere in the country, <laughs> anywhere in the U.S., you're going to have the same offerings. Yeah. Um, and they're going to taste, most of them are going to taste quite different than from, from China. Yeah. So that would be Americanized food. That's right. That's right. It's pretty... And you're contrasting that with fusion food... Right, so the fusion food would be more of you're adding an element of another culture's cuisine or influence into another one. So it could be, I remember I went to a sushi restaurant years ago. It was um, Cuban mixed Ooh. with Japanese, which cool. was really cool. Yeah. So they did some unique, you know, they had a unique taste, a twist on their sushi, for example. Um, I just remember that being a really cool fusion that I hadn't even thought about. You'll, you might see like French um, French and American fusion. So fusion is when you combine two different cuisines and you bring in elements of both. And that's really nice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to sort of dive into a little bit about the standard American diet because that's another question that I get a lot when I'm abroad. And it's related to this idea of what do Americans eat? Typically, typically, um, it's not that great. It's it tends to be on the sweeter side, carb heavy, um, you know, lacking fiber and nutrients and vegetables. Yeah, there's there's a um, we have a, a doctor we like to listen to, Peter Atia, and he has a, a funny acronym for the standard American diet. Yeah, which the acronym is S A D, right? Standard American diet which of course spells sad. And from a health perspective, the standard American diet is a little sad because you know if you look at uh, obesity charts, America's definitely at the top among the countries in the world, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're very high up there. Yeah. Um, and that has a lot to do with the standard American diet, which as you said, is yeah. very carbohydrate uh, intensive, yeah. 
a lot of sugar. Um, and then of course, diet gets combined with lifestyle, yes. you know, which is increasingly sedentary. You have to be more, more proactive yeah. about being active. 100%. Yeah. And a lot of people are busy and they don't you know, get yeah. around to it. Yeah. So you couple that with the kind of you know, large portions of uh, food that can ultimately you know, uh, lead to metabolic imbalances, um, you end up um, with a situation where you have a lot of obesity and, um, you know, blood sugar dysregulation. Right. But on the flip side, now that we're sort of being even more aware, I'm thinking generally as American people in terms of the standard American diet and how that might not be the best diet, which it definitely is not the best diet to sort of follow or eating patterns to have. Now there's these trends of these wellness trends where people are really into looking after themselves, getting daily movement, getting their veggies in, getting their fiber in, that kind of thing. So yeah, there's definitely nice. the the trend is toward um, improving. The, I mean, America tries hard, right? For sure. So uh, it's tough, right? Americans are very science oriented. They really like science. Yeah. The problem is nutritional science is such a difficult topic. So yeah. the standard American diet, it's its not just Americans choose to eat that way. We've been told by the government that this is the healthy way to eat. There's the food pyramid yeah. and at the bottom are carbohydrates, right? I remember that, um, yeah. And, and, you know, fats are at the top. Eat no fat, eat lots of carbohydrates. So when you have, think of a pyramid, right? This is what they would teach us in school when we yeah. had a nutrition class where the bottom would be the ingredients, the foods that you should eat the most of. And the bottom being the largest. Right. right, as a pyramid, if you think up. of yeah. like a triangle, right? The base is the is the largest portion, and you should have, I remember there being bread, rice, grains. Yeah, all the stuff that makes you fat, right. basically. And then at the top is the healthy fats, maybe the butter and this and that. But what we realize now is that we're supposed to invert that triangle. So To some extent. To some yeah. extent. And The point is we got the order wrong, yeah. right? Our, <laughs> we don't really know what the answer is. What we can say for sure is that if you look at the statistics, our weight has increased over time right. and our other metabolic you know, biomarkers have gotten worse. So whatever it is we're doing, it's not it's working. It's not working. And so there is, as you said, yeah. um, a trend toward more conscious eating, yeah. a more thoughtful eating. Right, mindful eating. Mindful eating. And you know, I, you know, whether or not any specific fad is accurate or, or effective is less important than the fact that you know we're at least trying. We we have um, it's it's a real focus yeah. for Americans now, and yeah. um, I think you know most people now try and, and think more carefully about what it is they're eating, um, and hopefully over time we start to hone in on um, some of the healthier healthier habits that other countries have. One hundred percent, and I think it's you know it's about sort of taking in the information and seeing what works for you and your lifestyle and and your personal preferences too, because. You might love that, you know, latte that's loaded with sugar, but maybe you keep that and you swap something else out that you are okay to swap out, or maybe you eliminate it altogether, right? So it's really interesting when we get asked that question because it, it gives me pause and it, you know, it, it causes me to think a little bit and sort of, I mean, I know for a fact for me, I mean, I don't eat burgers and hamburgers and or burgers and hamburgers are the same thing, but... <laughs> you know, burgers, pizza, fries, uh, with any regularity. I mean, I might have that once a year, maybe twice a year. You know, it's a special occasion. Yeah, the traditional American food is best had um, sparingly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but at the same time, there are also ways to make traditional American food uh, healthier. more healthy, right? Yeah. So a pizza, for example, right? That's a lot of bread. Yeah. Um, and bread... It's definitely going to spike your blood glucose. It's definitely going to produce a lot of calories and negative effects, metabolic effects. Right. So maybe replace the standard bread in, the, in a pizza dough um, with something that's you know less caloric, less um, uh, high glycemic, right? So yeah. you could use cauliflower so you can get cauliflower crust. Yeah. Um, I've made it. It's actually really fun to make. I've made cauliflower pizza. Yep. And, um, you know, it takes a little, it's a little bit involved. There are a couple of steps, but it's fun. You know, it's it's a fun thing to do. You can um, use cost of a flour. Exactly. So there's many different ways that you can sort of modify. So yeah. pasta, right? Pasta is another very carb-intensive yeah. food. Um, 
but one of the pastas we love is a red lentil pasta. Yeah, it's really good. So they make it, you know, it tastes, it has the texture of pasta. Yeah. Um, it has almost the flavor of pasta. Oh yeah, I prefer it. But to... there's no there's no wheat yeah. in there. Instead, they're using red lentil flour, which is yeah. higher in fiber and it's not going to spike your blood glucose. As yeah, much. and it tastes really good. I mean, I remember when these sort of I think the chickpea pasta was the first to come to the market, come onto the market, and I remember trying that maybe six seven years ago. Yeah. And being like, oh, this is amazing. This is you know one of the greatest inventions ever <laughs> created. Um, and trying it, and I remember it being a little bit like granular. There was, you could tell that it wasn't smooth. It definitely felt like you were not eating pasta. Um, but I didn't mind it. I actually enjoyed the texture. But it's so remarkable to see that they've really honed it over the years. And now it's like you can't even tell the difference, really, especially when you put all the they've ingredients. Got, they're really good at it. Yeah. 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 You put the pasta sauce and the veggies and whatever you want to put in there. You can't tell the difference, honestly. Right. So that's one approach. And then the other approach is, you know, eat whatever you want, but just really control the portion size. Yeah. So, that's you another know, method. instead of the American portion yeah. size, have a Japanese portion size, which, right. you know, from my experience in Japan is much smaller. And so that way you yeah. can still eat these dense caloric items, but you're having less of it. And so... Right. Um, and I think the big takeaway with that is the satiety. So in order, like the feeling of fullness and feeling like you're you're fine, you're not going to eat anymore after your meal, you feel satisfied with your meal. The biggest thing with that is the processed food. And so if you're not eating processed food and you make your own burger, you'll feel way fuller with that because the idea is that you've used whole ingredients, um, you know, you know what's going into the burger that you're making or the bread that's Definitely. in there. Because yeah. the processed food is not going to keep you full. I mean, you can look into it. There have been many studies about how the brain, the signal that our brains get is not, I'm done eating, I'm full. And the hunger hormone, we call it, it's ghrelin. We're not going to get into all the science of it, but you can definitely look into it, and it's really remarkable. Yeah, it tricks your brain. So things like sugar uh, and processed foods often have hidden sugar. You don't even, yes. it doesn't taste sweet, but there's sugar in there yeah. to affect the flavor and sodium, right? They can trick your brain into, um, you know, thinking it's not even eating anything. And so you keep so, eating. So, so that's the big one, I think, yes. the processed food. And there is a lot of that in America, but being cognizant of it, being aware of that, you can definitely, like you said, make those healthy swaps, make it at home, and you can still enjoy, enjoy typical American fare, but, you know, healthier, and you can with do it with your, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. All right, so I think we covered more or less the idea of what do Americans eat. I think that there's a lot to unpack here, and I think that we definitely touched upon different elements, and we got into the standard American diet, the new wellness culture trends, and how Americans in general are trying to make more of an effort now that we have new research and more information, which is always important, right? Being able to get our hands on that information that we can apply to our own lives and make the decisions that are best for us and our families. Yeah, and to keep an open mind about it. Um, and to remember that, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's important to protect traditions and to enjoy life uh, and all the delicious things that come with that. Right. And on the other hand, uh, moderating that in a way where you can also enjoy life being healthy, right, yeah. and, and happy about that. Um, so finding that balance um, and coming to, yeah, a nice sort of middle equilibrium uh, is the uh, optimal way that we all sort of aspire to find. That's right. I love <laughs> it. That's a wonderful outlook on it, for yes. sure. All right, advanced English learners, that is the end of this conversation. I'm so happy that Greg joined us for it. Feel free to leave us a comment down below for other topics that you would love for us to discuss here on Advanced English. All right, be sure you're subscribed, check out our podcast, leave a nice review, and share this channel with your friends and family. See you next time.